facing youth in care in New Brunswick. Um, for those of you who may or may not be aware of the definition of what in care is, it's always a question we get. Uh, being in care is just essentially being under the care of the government. That could be social development if, in the case of something like foster care, or it could be like open and closed custody arrangements uh, in the case of something like public safety. So essentially any youth that is um, taken into the care of the province in some form or way, uh, we try to work with them in the youth care network. Uh, we sort of give them a voice and we try to build community and give them kind of a sense of belonging for the most part, this is a population that's often under-engaged and disenfranchised in many ways. So we try to kind of promote that kind of engagement with more of that population. Where is it that tend to the I lost your clicky thing, Mark. It's right uh, on the other side of your jacket there. It's on your clicky thing, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, how this works, um, oh, I guess we could present ourselves, hey? that uh, after a number of brainstorming sessions and consultations and stuff, we, there were certain key issues that just kept coming up. And since this is uh, human or Children's Rights Week or in line with Children's Rights Week Day or whatever it is, we decided we would use as a basis the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So we just basically plucked out all the articles in Convention on the Rights of the Child that were most applicable to youth in care, and we went over them one after the other, and we talked about them. What do they mean? How do they relate to being in care in New Brunswick, uh, are these rights being met, are they not being met, to what extent are they being met, those kind of questions. And we plucked out a, a few key kind of topics that came out of that. Uh, not all of them were particularly relevant to our situation, some of them were more relevant than others. So this is sort of the end result of that process. So we're going to go through uh, two or three different topics, and we're just going to talk about them, and Alicia's going to give some uh, experiences, anecdotal experiences, and that kind of thing. And uh, we'll also kind of open the floor to you guys to try to contribute. I mean, this is a very small group, so it'd be nice if we can kind of make it into maybe a discussion or a brainstorming. I'm sure that a lot of your social work students have not only uh, a lot of best in education, but probably a lot of good things to say. So it'd be nice to get your input in this as well. Um, and former social workers, in some cases. And I can answer pretty much any question you have. And there was somebody else who was supposed to be here. He may may show up if there were some issues with scheduling. So uh, that's the other the third game that we see on there. All right. So being in care in New Brunswick. Is this button the right button? <coughs> Where do I plug it? Here. Fundamentally, being in care means a lot of things to a, a youth. Um, someone young is in contact with the family, they're taking on the family situation. In some cases, that may be for the better. We hope that in most cases it is for the better, but the child doesn't necessarily always understand why. To them, what they see is a loss of family, a loss of identity, and a loss of self. The very aspect of family is, is crucial to our development as people. Uh, those of us who were blessed enough to have a family for our lives, we, we know this, right? We have this always as a backbone for people we can talk to, the people we can relate to. We don't always have the best relationship with these people, but it doesn't matter. It's always a state of permanency. When you're placed into something like foster care, suddenly that permanency is removed. And it's more than just a lack of family. It's, it's a loss of everything that defines you for who you are. You have no no longer anyone to define yourself against. You have no parents, no siblings. If you have siblings, to kind of define yourself. So it's very much a loss of family and a loss of self. Um, and maybe, maybe Alicia, if you want to talk to us a little bit about your situation uh, when you were taking into foster care and maybe some of the benefits uh, that, that did arrive from foster care, because I'm assuming it wasn't all bad. So maybe we can just start with that. Um, I was taken out of my parents' home when I was 12. Um, it was personal choice uh, because I didn't want to be in the situation. 
situations that I was in. Um, and I was um, placed in a foster care family, which was my own family. My aunt and uncle became my foster parents. Um, they went and took the courses and did all of the procedures that they needed to to take me in as their foster child. Um, so that was a benefit for me because I still stayed with family that was my own. Um, and they were more understanding and um, were able to relate to what I had gone through because they knew my parents and knew everything from the, from the get-go. So um, that was a benefit. Um, oh, that's a good start. I don't know, maybe, why don't we try to make this more of a discussion? Do you guys have any questions about uh, about this particular idea? Yeah. Well, I just recently got a new job at a group home. Okay. Um, it's a new one starting from about a month in the residential services. And for starters, um, I think he's supposed to come maybe this month, and if not, or sorry, about December, and if not, a little bit after this month. So I'm just wondering, is this something that you would want to connect our residents with? Care network in particular? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, definitely. We've been in talks with a bunch of these residences a few times, um, but certainly any, any way we can try to build new relationships and that sort of thing uh, would be worth exploring, yeah, for sure. If you if you want to connect after me through your email and all that kind of thing, I'll talk a little bit about your website towards the end of this. But, yeah, yeah, I think basically more of a, I guess help me understand what he's coming from. Push on 
find that because of me, which I still feel was a good idea at the time. Um, but my parents have since grown and um, learned from their mistakes, which was good, but I still didn't want to go back. So. Yeah. Um, which I guess leads pretty well into the next question. So why don't we just go ahead and convince the rights of the child article 12. Basically the idea is that children, if we're going to make decisions about children, we should ask their their point of view, right? And I mean, children don't necessarily, depending on the age of the child, know exactly what's best for them. I think we could probably agree on that. But at the very least, they should be sort of engaged in the process. Um, in Alicia's case, for instance, it, it reflects that very well. She was able to, to kind of talk and, and be removed from that environment. Now, I mean, was there a challenge associated with that? I mean, did you have to you know, convince them that the environment was bad, or was it pretty? Or I mean, when I told him what was going on, it was kind of like, why didn't you know about this sooner? Um, of course, we want to remove you from that situation. Um, I was a little bit older, so I knew that those things were not things that other children were going through. Um, so I was able to make that decision my own, and um, it was what I felt was right. But uh, the idea of consulting. In my sister's case, they didn't really understand because they were too young. So um, when they were asked, you know, what's going on in your family, they didn't really understand that those were bad things. So they did, like, they just thought that I was supposed to get them up and get them ready for school and make sure that everything was okay before they went to school. And they would just say, like, um, yeah, mom goes to work a lot. So they didn't really understand that. Um, First of all, I guess I just want to say kudos to you for being so young and recognizing that. But I'm just kind of curious if you're comfortable talking about how you went about it. Like, did you talk to a teacher or a close friend who was an adult? Or just wondering, because it obviously wasn't recognized, I guess, by the system and then it's something that yourself. And um, well, I had had past experiences because of things that had happened when I was way younger. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of knew the system anyway. And I knew um, that I had a social worker to go to if I needed to. Um, wasn't necessarily with the same situation that I was in, um, but I there was a particular situation that happened um, probably on a Thursday. And when I went to school on Friday, I mentioned to a teacher, and they said, "Okay, make sure you do something about this. Like tell your aunt because your aunt will be able to do the most for you." Um, because teachers knew that I was in an abusive home, a neglectful home, um, there wasn't really much that they could do. They talked to social workers, they would, the social workers would come and talk to my mother, and my mother would tell them this big story, um, and then it would just be blown over. So with this particular situation, I was able to really get out, like, it was like a final straw kind of thing. Um, and I, I just told a teacher and then went to my aunt when she got home, I told her what happened, and she said, you're never going back there. So it was just kind of like, we, we already knew, we were already in the process of getting out, it was just like one more thing that needed to be done, or, or um, that happened to push it further to get out, so. It was a long process. <laughs> Prior to that, had you voiced to like a social worker or anyone that you wanted to be out? Um, kind of, because I, they weren't able to really do anything because they didn't have evidence to go by um, to get me out of there. So, um, like, my aunt would just come and get me on weekends so I wouldn't be there on extended periods of time with my parents to be neglected and not be able to have a childhood. So, on, it started when I was probably in grade two, they would start coming, picking me up and taking me every weekend that they could. Um, and then, just that one more thing, it just made it so it was perfect. So, I hope that answers your question. Definitely. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious because as a future social worker, I'm just wondering because if I have a little girl come to me and say, you know, home isn't, isn't a good spot for me, I don't really feel like fit there. I mean, to me, that sounds like it would be enough. Like, it's not. It's, it's not, not always enough. Um, and I really struggled with that because I knew that would happen if I became a social worker. I knew that you can't always 
intervene. You can't always take them out of the situation, and they don't always want to get out of the situation as well. So it's hard to make that decision. Um, and I just knew I couldn't do that. <laughs> but I, I give great kudos to social workers because I know how hard it is for them, especially the ones that are in child placement. So. Yeah. Um, it's important to know as well that sort of goes back to what we just said, um, but this idea that they won't necessarily believe you. And, and this happens in, in, in many cases if the child is placed into foster care where they move around a lot. Often what will happen is the stigma will be developed around that child. And, and social workers to some extent are guilty of this as well, uh, but they are, tend to be a little more sensitive than others. But the stigma that if you were placed in multiple homes over a short period of time, and somehow it's something that you are doing wrong. That you must be a difficult child, you must be behaviorally challenged or what have you, and that's why they keep shoveling you around to different houses. And what will happen often is, it'll get to a point where despite anything they might want to say about the different foster homes or whatever, they just kind of give up. They stop, they stop talking about it in that way, they just don't tell people what's going on anymore. Because when they do, what the chances are, what's going to happen is they're going to get moved around again. And after a while, they're just sick of it. They want some permanency. Even if that permanency is not fantastic, they just want to stay there. Um, and even if they do tell, they're not necessarily always listened to. Um, I don't know if you have any experiences with that question, or if in your case it was pretty good. Or it's really with the family, the social workers as well. Yeah, I've had some social workers that didn't really listen. almost just kind of brushed off as I was a troubled child and that some of these, I almost felt like sometimes they were blaming me for some of the things that happened. So that wasn't always a good process. Um, but I found uh, two, just two social workers in particular that were really helpful and really listened to me and really focused on getting my mental health better and, um, and knew that, I, that they pushed it so that I could trust them. And it took a lot, but um, I got to that point where I was able to tell them pretty much anything, even if it was something with my foster family that wasn't going particularly well. Um, they were, I could tell them that because I, I knew that they weren't just going to rip me out of that home because I told them until I got punished for this. But they were pretty understanding. And um, they really built up their trust with me, and that's a big thing that needs to be done when, um, when you're taking a foster care child that brought me out of my home, um, my father said to me, go ahead, tell them they're not going to believe you. It's not going to make a difference. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I knew that they were going to believe me and that something was going to be done about it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask, was there, do you remember any like, particular qualities about the social workers or practices they did or anything that really helped you along the way to understand and get that connection? Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, I was with one social worker for a really long time. Um, when I first went to her, I would talk. I just sat there. Um, I was 
really stubborn. I didn't want to tell her what was going on in my head. I didn't want to tell her what had happened. I just wanted to sit there. And she just did that. She said, okay, like, when you want to talk, you can talk. And every time if I did one thing, she would reward me with like a candy or um, a sticker or something. Um, and was just like, you know, you did a good job today. You didn't say a lot, that's fine. You don't need to. Um, and every time I went in, each time she would reward me for more and more. And uh, eventually I could go in without being rewarded and just tell her everything. So um, that was a really good quality of her. And that worked for me. It doesn't necessarily work for everybody. But I found that was one particular uh, quality that she had that really worked well for me. So. The question of, of, of trust is, is huge, right? Mm -hmm. So she says that they're, they're, they're used to people basically leaving, leaving their lives. something that allows, that makes them lose that trust. So the question of trust when it comes to foster parents is very, very big. It's a, it's a constant kind of uh, topic that comes up. Did you have anything else to add? <laughs> um, I don't remember. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Are, are there any other say is okay, except that it, it, it ignores certain challenges that people who are from care tend to face. For instance, if, when I grew up or whatever and got my first job and all this kind of stuff, uh, my ties with my mother, uh, who raised me my entire life, were cut in the sense of financial she was no longer supporting me and that sort of thing. But I knew that if I got in trouble, I could pick up the phone and call my mother. I also knew that when Christmas time came around or my birthday came around, I could call my mother and that connection still exists. Whereas people from foster care do not have that connection in many cases. They do not have that family. They do not have somebody to call uh, if they can't pay the rent or buy food for a month. Or if they just need to talk because something went badly. Um, they could be struggling in school and not have anyone to talk about with that too. No one that they at least trust necessarily. No one that is um, kind of a key figure for them. So this idea of leaving the care system and uh, this is something that is coming up quite often recently in, in, in this kind of circle. This question of should there be something more being done, more like a, a transition or something of this sort. And maybe this is a good place for people who are studying social work to give that a bit of advice. You, you will be the ones that possibly are working in this kind of environment. So um, I don't know if, if I'm sure you, you do have a few things to say about that. I don't know. Yeah, why don't, why don't you give us um, your experience or however you want to go about it, and maybe some of the future social workers can provide some input. Sure. <laughs> um, I just graduated last January, um, so my um, contract I guess, ended in January. Um, and I didn't feel like I was prepared enough for that to happen. Um, there's no 
no, there's no grace period, there's no um, transition period. Um, it's very much like, okay, you're graduating, good job, you got your BA, uh, we're done. And that was kind of, it was hurtful um, because I felt like they were the ones that I um, went to when I needed any financial support, if I needed emotional support, if I needed um, anything at all. going on in my mind right now and I don't have anyone to go to. Um, so I find that there should be a transition period for them to have that emotional, um, financial support for a little longer so that I can get on my feet and you know, spread my wings. <laughs> right now I kind of feel like I'm stuck in the nest. So uh, that's my little take on that right now. <laughs> um, yeah, I just got out of the, out of the care system. Like they don't. 
don't fund you for your second degree, obviously, um, uh, which I only found out in my third year <laughs> as I was going into my fourth year, so I was kind of in shock. Um, so I took my fourth year to decide that, okay, well, I don't think I'm ready to graduate yet. So I did take an extra semester, and they did fund me for that. Um, um, but they didn't necessarily you know, help me prepare to be on my own. I kind of thought there would be a transition time. I didn't realize that it was kind of like case closed. They didn't really prepare me for that kind of. Uh, I thought that if there was still making contact with my social worker after, like she would still try to keep in touch with me or um, something, but that didn't happen. That's not, I guess that's not really what happened, and I didn't know that. So um, I was kind of in shock. <laughs> and I still kind of am. Um, it doesn't feel like that should be what happens. Um, so I guess, no, they didn't prepare me um, for that. into art therapy and I did get accepted and I did go there and then I didn't get funding from the from the Dunsing Free Loan. So I had to come back. And so I'm going through a lot of other problems um, associated with that shop as well, <laughs> you know, um, not being able to go to school when I thought I would be. Um, so. so it's not only that would take. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, I think it's worth at least starting the discussion. Yeah. Alicia, from your from your per perspective, is it the services which were provided by uh, social development, which uh, a continuance would, would ease the transition, or is it the more uh, family support uh, which would assist in that transition? Which which to you? It, it needs to be a combination of yeah. both. Yeah, and even yeah. if it's just like weaning off like certain things as as it goes along over a six month period or or whatever, but um, I could use those benefits right now, and I could use those um, the emotional support, and I could use um, you know having someone to talk to um, on a regular basis, or just emailing them say. You know, I'm having trouble with this. Do you know have any, Do you have any resources? Do you know how I can go about this? Do you, um, or um, they also like helped me with um, 
resources are tapped. <laughs> mm. But it would be nice to have it a little bit longer than, than what they provide. Even anecdotally, are, are you aware of any cases where uh, foster families have continued to kind of mentor uh, children who had previously been in their care after the end of a contract? Well, we just went to a conference in Ottawa, or in Toronto, um, just last Friday, um, and there were lots of cases where you know they were talking about how great their foster family was and how they were still involved even after the age of 21, which is their cutoff here. Um, and they were still supporting them and, and being there. Um, but there's also lots of cases that are like mine. You know, the family is no longer as involved as they were. And mine was kind of like a gradual um, thing. Like my foster family, they just kind of slowly trickled out of my life so that it wouldn't be as obvious. But I feel like now when I need, you know, the most of my support, like the time when I'm going through my roughest time as an Has the network tried to fill that gap in any ways in, in oh. terms of communal support? And yeah. Um, well, I, I'm, this is like the reason why I keep going, you know, pushing because I feel like I get a chance to be a leader and be involved with other foster youth. Like Aaron and I both went to the conference in Toronto with Matthew and uh, it's a good experience because I was, you know, there with somebody else who's gone through the same things I have and have the same kind of um, emotions or thoughts towards being in care, um, but although our situations are very different, it's still, there's a, a bond and connection there that you know, other people can't fill that gap. So yes, uh, the network has definitely provided me with some sort of you know, boost. Yeah. <laughs> Does the network provide a system or a navigation as well? Like some of the some of the skill building uh, things that you had mentioned, such as you know, job search, resume critiquing. Uh, does the network offer a bit of navigation for the system, which would be in place uh, for people post care? Yeah, the, this whole issue of, of leaving care. Uh, I was just talking to, with, with John before, before you had arrived, and he mentioned that uh, the the youth and care ne networks in other provinces are are quite well developed. Have you guys undergone a bit of a comparative analysis to see what uh, uh, deliverables are are most sought after in those other provinces, and look to replicate them here? Yeah, we've connected with the network.
Zuko, the professionals, who is Alicia, to be able to give us the feedback on where the gaps are relating to their own personal situation. Because that's where the that's where the importance is for us. It's not in in trying to necessarily replicate uh, a network in another province. Maybe some logistical areas would be replicated in some you know some some how tos, but really the benefits that we feel that we can develop and build as a network in New Brunswick is really based on the personal experiences of kids who are in care or, or who are in care. And that's because it's such a different experience for each individual. Um, you mentioned the transitioning from care. Um, I would imagine that if you asked a social worker if their transition process was out of, they may respond yes. However, if you ask the individual who's being transitioned out, if it's adequate, their response may be no. But not all. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, so part of uh, where I feel that, that uh, you know, the department can evolve and grow is by engaging and really capitalizing on the information that they're going to get from those youth who are with them in order to learn more about how transition processes would work for each individual, right? Because what may work for Alicia is not the same as what may work for Johnny down the road. Maybe that process for Johnny is great, but for Alicia, that's where it has to be more fluid, right? We have to be more flexible in how we work with youth in care of the province in order to especially meet the uh, convention. Should kids get lots of notifications saying, you know, when your case is closed, like these are the things that are going to stop? But I didn't necessarily know that it was going to be ending with her. Like I didn't realize that um, she wouldn't email me, you know, on a regular basis, or she wouldn't, you know, come up to visit me occasionally um, where I felt that that should be. So when we have um, the association, for instance, come and teach us about what we are ethically obligated to do, it's important that they can be based on the feedback and experience that they have. So my advice is actually go with the social worker out there. I think it would be useful for us to be able to practically apply the things that we're given in theory. Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea of the Australians. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say on behalf of the, uh, the Atlantic Human Rights Center, it was a, a pleasure to host you guys today and, uh, and um, very much allowed your efforts to give voice to a demographic within society which very often is spoken for. So it's very refreshing to hear uh, the personal uh, emphasis on, on, on the, the structural critique. 
Um, so, a as you had mentioned, this was one activity which was uh, done in conjunction with the New Brunswick um, Child and Youth Advocate. They're running a, a whole series of events throughout the week. Uh, so, uh, if this is an interest for you, there's uh, lots of stuff going on. So, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. <laughs>